Hi, I'm Steve Selig, founder of FitTest, and the topic of this video is spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or SCAD, directed for exercise professionals. I'm going to talk about what it is, uh, diagnosis, interventions, medications, and rehabilitation, and present one of my case studies. Now, I should add at the beginning of this presentation that I've only been aware of uh, SCAD for the past 12 months, and I've only had uh, so far two clients with SCAD, so it's relatively new. But this really matches up to some extent with what's happening in medicine because it's it's also relative. It has been previously uh, fairly under recognised and underdiagnosed, and therefore undertreated uh, previously. Although there's a lot more awareness recently of SCAD. Now the other thing before I leave this opening slide is that SCAD is the predominant reason or cause of uh, myocardial infarction in relatively young women. It's by far more common in relatively young woman, uh, women than any other demographic. And I'll come to that uh, in this presentation. So in, in, it occurs in young, relatively young women in the age of you know, 40 to 50 years of age, related sometimes to pregnancy, uh, has been under-recognised and under-diagnosed. And so I hope this, this presentation will at least come some way to raising your awareness as an exercise professional of this condition. So first of all, what is it? Um, spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD is defined as epicardial coronary artery dissection that is not associated with atherosclerosis or trauma uh, and is not iatrogenic. Iatrogenic meaning of human cause or if you like, uh, medically caused. Um, so it's not caused by something that medicine or some medical intervention would do. Um, uh, and epicardial refers to the major coronary arteries on the outside of the heart that then go in and branch into the smaller arteries. The predominant mechanism of myocardial injury, which results in STEMI, is coronary artery obstruction. And that's caused by the formation of an intramural hematoma, which I'm going to show you in a minute, or intimal disruption, um, such as um, dysplasia, uh, of uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, obstructing the true lumen rather than an atherosclerotic plaque uh, which might rupture and then cause an intraluminal thrombus. So it's not about atherosclerosis or thrombus, but it is about intramural hematoma or large blood clot forming almost extravascularly. So just to show uh, some pictures of the various uh, artery models, here we just have a normal artery with laminar flow. And this one is a cross section through an artery with severe atherosclerotic plaque shown as the uh, fiber muscular, um, uh, the um, smooth muscle cell proliferation, and particularly shown in yellow here is the atheroma or fatty core with severe narrowing, severe um, stenosis obstruction. And this, uh, the endothelium in this region of severe stenosis can fracture or ulcerate under this turbulent flow, for example, uh, or the inflammatory condition going on and form a, um, uh, an, intraluminal thrombus here and completely block off this artery and, call a my, and cause a myocardial infarction. Now this is the beginning of a spontaneous coronary artery dissection showing the disruption to the inner lining of the artery producing a false lumen to, together with the true lumen and if that progresses uh, then in the false lumen a hematoma uh, can form a large blood clot can form which will further occlude uh, this artery and eventually become a critical narrowing of the artery of the true lumen uh, resulting in a STEMI or ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction I'll show you in a minute. So this just to show some angiograms of the concept that I just presented uh, shown in white all these white arrows are referring to spontaneous coronary artery dissections so it is able to be picked up on uh, coronary angiograms. And there, as I said, there's at the beginning, there is more recognition of this now, particularly within that female demographic, 45 to 50 years. 
So it, it's unlikely that it will have so much under recognition as in previous times. The epidemiology, 85% of cases are women, with most of them being in the age of 45 to 50 years of age. So relatively young women, wouldn't even call them middle age, and a range of 30 to 60 years. There are frequent missed diagnoses, although this is improving. There's possible association with exogenous hormones. There's very weak evidence for this in terms of the contraceptive pill, for example. Very weak evidence, and I certainly don't want to overplay that. Uh, of the 10 references I read for this presentation, only one of them even mentioned this. Uh, increased, but there is very good evidence for increased incidence with pregnancy, especially if it's the second or subsequent pregnancy for a woman, and especially if it's associated with increases in blood pressure, particularly in the third trimester, which is where it, it occurs. It also has high incidence postpartum, so after the baby is born, associated with that subsequent pregnancy. Uh, there's an increased association or incidence with fibromuscular dysplasia, which is abnormal growth of arterial walls that are not related to atherosclerosis or inflammation. These are, the, these are muscular uh, proliferations. There's an increase of incidence with connective tissue disorders, and I've covered that in some of my other uh, videos on my YouTube channel. Unfortunately, there is a very significant mortality uh, with a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And so this must be, there must be high recognition of this condition so it can be treated early. It can be triggered by a, a such wide array of events such as, well, high blood pressure events such as exercise. And we need to be careful with exercise. And in my case study, I'm going to show you the care that I took around blood pressure related to exercise in my client. So we do need to be careful with exercise related to high blood pressure um, with uh, women in this age group. Uh, pregnancy, third trimester particularly, um, the labour and also postpartum uh, and also any straining manoeuvres such as in the Valsalva manoeuvre. The presenting sin, uh, symptoms are quite uh, serious, acute coronary syndrome, being hospitalised for STEMI, ST elevation myocardial infarction, the predominant um, blood vessels that are involved are particularly the left anterior descending, but also uh, to a lesser extent, the left main coronary artery. There's far less in an incidence with the right coronary or the circumflex in terms of the epicardial arteries. Uh, these um, arterial um, stenoses or um, uh, the, the, the SCAD is associated with elevated cardiac enzymes, the myocardial infarctions, and as I said at the beginning of the presentation, it's the number one cause of STEMI for women in this age group of 45 to 50 years. So it needs to be recognised. Now, coming to uh, diagnosis, coronary artery computed tomography may be safer and preferred compared to coronary angiography, even though I showed you angiograms earlier. And the reason is the, angi the, the catheter of the, um, to, to, to perform the angiogram may in itself extend the um, spontaneous dissection of the artery. So there's some evidence of catheter produced extension of the dissection, which we need to be careful with. And that also applies to percutaneous uh, coronary interventions, uh, so PCIs, such, such as stenting. And it's one of the reasons why stenting is not the preferred option now for treating SCAD. Um, now, with com uh, coronary artery computed tomography, that is contraindicated in pregnant women due to radio the potential for radiation harm to the baby. So this wouldn't be done in, in pregnant women, but there are other techniques available, uh, perhaps MRI, I'm not really sure, um, but um, uh, so that we can avoid coronary angiograms. Interventions. Uh, PCI, as I said before, percutaneous coronary interventions or stenting. However, there's a high incidence of technical failure for SCAD. There there have been adverse events uh, reported in much of the literature, which is, seems to be attributed to balloon-induced extension of the dissection. And there have even been a few reports of sudden cardiac death associated with PCI for spontaneous coronary artery dissection. 
So cabbage may be safer and more, and more effective than uh, PCI attacking um, or uh, treating the left anterior descending or the left main coronary artery. The presenting sim symptoms that I said are acute coronary syndrome or STEMI, medical arbor management. Interestingly, spontaneous healing is common and so doing nothing is, a, is, is an effective management strategy. However, that it, then it leaves the risk of recurrence. Now, in the terms of recurrence related to pregnancies, well, the obvious um, thing that a woman can consider at this point, and we'll have a discussion with their medical practitioners and other healthcare advisors, will be to whether she is going to go on to further pregnancies. Conservative management is preferred to interventional cardiology. Um, beta blockers, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, dual antiplatelet therapy or DAPT, such as aspirin and ticagrelor, all of these are, are fairly mainstream conservative management strategies uh, compared to interventions, um, surgical interventions or particularly PCI. Now, cardiac rehab is strongly recommended. That was recommended in many of the papers I read. Uh, one of the goals will be to decrease the fear of physical activity, but to balance this out in terms of the intensity of the exercise interventions that you're going to recommend for your client. And personally, I'm going to avoid very high intensity exercise that can raise the pressures in people who are still exposed to the risk of recurrence. But we also need, as I said, we, we do need to and consider exercise intensities and volumes in our exercise prescription. So it really requires a bit of expertise here and cardiac rehabilitation is strongly recommended and probably very effective. Now, just to a couple of the papers that I found uh, very useful on this topic, uh, and I'm not gonna go over them in depth, you'll be able to get some of these papers free on the, on the net. Uh, this particular one by Tweet and colleagues um, was on, um, um, SCAD and the, I'm just going to read the conclusion. Uh, the PCI for SCAD is associated with high rates of technical failure, even in those presenting with preserved vessel flow and does not protect against future target vessel revascularization or recurrence of spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So there, this paper recommended a strategy of conservative management with prolonged obs observation as, as preferable. Another paper by the same group, Tweet and colleagues, concluded, or part of the conclusion was that SCAD affects a young, predominantly female population, frequently presenting, unfortunately, with STEMI. Although in hospital mortality is low, regardless of the initial treatment, percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI, is associated with high rates of complication all the way up to sudden cardiac death. Risks of SCAD recurrence and major adverse ca uh, cardiac events in the long term emphasise the need for close follow-up. So fibro and fibromuscular dysplasia is a novel association, potentially causative factor. Now to coming to my presentation of a 52-year-old uh, female with multiple arterial aneurysms and dissections, including spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and she also had aortic root dilatation. <coughs> so she had <coughs> intracranial and aortic aneurysms, <coughs> mild proximal aortic dil dilatation, but not requiring surgery at the time, uh, a segment of infrarenal abdominal aortic dissection, which was asymptomatic, connective tissue disease, but not yet confirmed by diagnosis, her 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure, interestingly, they, they do these blood pressure measurements. She had good blood pressure control on perindopril and amlodipine. Anything ending in pril is an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, so perindopril. And anything ending in PINE or pine, amlodipine is a calcium channel blocker. And these are both first-line drugs for high blood pressure. Now, on those two drugs, she had very good 24-hour Halter uh, ambulatory blood pressure averaging 116 systolic. Uh, however, she was diagnosed with spontaneous coronary artery dissection and was being managed conservatively. Her medications, as I said, were perindopril and amlodipine. Now, to come to what we found, what I found on my um, 
exercise test, sign, symptom and fatigue limit and incremental exercise test. Uh, I'm not going to be too worried about the, um, the uh, arrhythmia. I mean, she did have some ectopic beats. She had a couplet of VEs, ventricular ectopics here, another couplet of peak exercise. These weren't the reasons for stopping exercise, even though there were quite a number of ectopic beats. I'll go straight to why I stopped exercise. And I, I must admit, there are no published, there are no evidence-based uh, guidelines um, nationally or internationally published on exercise for people uh, with either current or past history of spontaneous coronary artery dissection. There's no guideline to go to. So I had to simply rely on clinical reasoning. And I decided once that systolic blood pressure was approaching 170, that was enough for me. And I stopped the exercise test, even though uh, the ratings of perceived exertion were just 13 out of 20, somewhat hard. And clearly she, she could have gone on to more exercise than she did. But I stopped it on the basis of this systolic reaching 169. Uh, for that reason, um, she, her heart rate peak only averaged 72% of age predicted heart rate peak for this 52-year-old. Um, there's a very slight bradycardia attached to amlodipine. Uh, it's only a few beats. It's nothing like beta blockade. That's not really explaining the 72%. That's explained by the very much the submaximal nature of the exercise test. Um, recovery blood pressures were fine. Um, so all her blood pressures were fine. I'm happy for her to exercise up to this level or shortly under or just under this level, uh, but not happy to go much above this level. Uh, there's nothing else remarkable on this page. Her uh, breathlessness was, was moderate, um, but um, uh, the main reason for stopping, as I said, was blood pressure. So this is the exercise test that she underwent um, uh, using my fit test uh, application. And you can see here um, um, quite a number of minutes of exercise that we're able to get. So we can prescribe a safe and effective exercise intensities here that are on the low side of what her, this is her VO2 peak. But remember, this is going to be very much a submaximal VO2 peak, not her actual VO2 max because we stopped early at that systolic blood pressure of 169. And again, this is going to be on the low side, underestimated uh, because we stopped early. So this just shows how I prescribed exercise. And again, although this is percent of VO2 peak and 90% looks high, this has to be taken on the basis that uh, this VO2 peak is probably, isn't almost certainly an underestimation of her true VO2 max because we stopped early. So I'm quite happy to go to 90% here. And what I did was a stepped up interval training program using active recoveries of one minute period between the effort levels. Effort levels around 90%, the um, uh, recovery levels around 47% or so. Uh, worked out on my fit test app. And we had two minutes on, one minute off for about four repetitions and then stepped it back down to rest. So these are the, some of the references I use to put this uh, presentation together. Uh, thanks for looking at this video on a really interesting, uh, relatively newly recognised diagnosis of spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Bye for now.